Lord Derek, what makes a good statesman or a good stateswoman in times like these, in your view? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. Good question to start the morning. It's a combination of factors. You need to be uh, to be experienced. You need to understand the detail of whatever is- issue it is that you're addressing. You need to be able to speak to speak with fluency and authority. You need to be respected internationally so that people listen to and respond to what you say. But most important, I think, you need to be able to see the big picture, to understand the implications and consequences of what you are doing and saying, to understand where the history plays a part in things uh, and you know what will happen uh, as and when you you know you take decisions. So it's um, it's not universally held by by global leaders. Um, but when you see it, uh, you know, you, you recognise it and it's it's hugely valuable. OK, so Lord Derek, I'm not a diplomat, but I enjoy my football or I enjoy my rugby. Is it like watching Erling Haaland take the ball from midfield or Marcus Smith just dummy everybody and go, when you see it, you can't quite define it, but you think, my God, that bloke's just got a streak of excellence. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, I mean... Early Haaland is extraordinarily effective. He's more of a blunt instrument. I think of someone as a statement as more a kind, more a kind of a, a midfield general, a sort of Alonso figure. But um, it's someone who understands what's going on in football terms all over the pitch and can orchestrate things uh, and understands what his what his teammates and his opponents are capable of. Kim, I don't know whether you were listening at the top of the show. We played three clips of the current PM, the man who was PM and the man who wants to be PM. Uh, your assessment of those three, if you heard the clips. Look, I think, although I'm not a universal fan of, of this government's performance, that David Cameron has done well as Foreign Secretary. I think he has visibly toughened the line on Israel, uh, the Israeli ground operation in Gaza. Um, I think he's, tend- he's tended to be about a week ahead of what Tony Blinken and the Americans have been saying, which is, you know, a good place to be. Um, and I think he speaks with fluency and authority. And having been a, a former prime minister, he knows some of the figures. He can get in to see people like Netanyahu. Um, I think Sunak does fine, but I think he, he asked David Cameron to take on the job so that he could focus on domestic affairs. And he has pretty much left the pitch free to Cameron uh, to be a very, very senior uh, foreign secretary. I think uh, Keir Starmer... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough when, when this kind of global crisis is happening and basically you just have to sound supportive if you think the government is doing the right thing and they are doing the right thing at the moment and you're relegated to the final sentence in any news bulletin. <laughs> it's, it's a tough gig. Really enjoyed our time together, Kim. Thank you. Lord Derek, former UK National Security Advisor, former British Ambassador to the US and UK Permanent Representative to the European Union. 12 after 7. Let's get now to Tel Aviv. The latest out of Israel is the world continues to watch and wait for more details on what the response will look like. The country's war cabinet met yesterday for the fourth time in two days and the IDF's chief of the general staff, Lieutenant General Herzi Halivi, had this warning for Iran when he spoke from the Nevatim air base in southern Israel, which had been hit by Iran's attack on the weekend. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. The IDF remains ready to counter any threat from Iran and its terror proxies. Let's go to Richard Pater, who's director of the Britain-Israeli Communications and Research Organization, BICOM, joining me from Tel Aviv. Two key questions, I guess, Richard. Are we getting any indications of what the response might be, and just as importantly, when? Morning. Uh, good morning, Nick. Thank you for having me on. The truth is, no, we're still the, the government, as is, their, as is their right, is keeping everyone, everyone guessing. I think it actually it suits their agenda right now to keep Iran on their toes, to understand that the unprecedented attack of, on Saturday night of 300 rockets plus will have, will, deserves a response. They, it's, they, they've got it coming to them to that extent, but the timing is not clear. And I think it's also important that beyond, I suppose, the, the, some of the bluster and rhetoric, that the most likely scenario is still that Israel will look to be coordinated, certainly with their greatest ally, the US, but also the, also the UK and other regional allies, that any response will be in coordination. Richard, you mentioned the UK and the US. For local media, how are they portraying the response and support, or possibly lack of support, from those two countries? 
Yeah, I mean, it's not really perceived here as a lack of support. I mean, I think uh, if you if you listen to the to the comments both by the foreign secretary and by the prime minister in the Commons yesterday, they kind of they they, they recognise and gave their backing to Israel and the understanding of what the Iranian regime is. And I think there's the there's a, to an extent to have the eyes on the bigger prize here that there is global concern, obviously felt acutely here in Israel, but across the Western world over the threat that Iran poses, especially with regard to their their nuclear program. So I think Israel, if they're if they're smarting and boxing, boxing clever here, will understand that although, yes, they have the right to retaliate, the, the, the necessity is, is to still maintain that important global coalition that saw the UK and the US, the Jordanians, alongside Israel on Saturday night and prepare for any future offensive from Iran. Richard Larcy is a long-standing commentator on Israeli parliamentary affairs. The idea that Benjamin Netanyahu should take the win and pause, how likely is that in your view? Well, I think he's taking it in the short term. I think certainly I'm not sure he in Israel, he gets the credit necessarily. I think most of the credit goes to the uh, to the IDF and the Israeli Air Force and the uh, and the anti-missile defense system and those and those and those manning it. Netanyahu doesn't necessarily get a success out of this, but it is part of that gradual rehabilitation in the public's image after the, the uh, kind of the, the horrors of, uh, of October the 7th. So it's part of that rehabilitation. But I don't think there's, there's still a, a lot of pushback within the Israeli public that says after such horrific attack on Saturday night, it demands a response. Some kind of this concept of deterrence, if they're serious about it, it means that Iran needs to pay the, the consequences. Richard Pater, director of BICOM, joining us from Tel Aviv. So there's the question. We need statesmen and stateswomen. It just so happens in the UK we're talking about men. Statesmen to step forward. So how would we look on the world stage, Rishi Sunak and Lord Cameron, as opposed to Sakir Starmer and David Lammy, the shadow foreign who would, of course, I assume, become foreign secretary? What would that do for the UK standing?